I appreciate all you guys for coming out and, and uh, showing the uh, support for the PowerShell community here. Um, just to re uh, just to kind of reiterate some of the things Don and Jeffrey said. Ask questions as we go through. Um, you know, I I, w I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole if uh, there's questions on something. Um, and also, you know, this room of people is one of the best resources you'll ever have to work with, uh, whether they're the speakers or the other attendees. Uh, this is you know this is a this is representative of your PowerShell community and the folks who are most invested in this stuff. So uh, take advantage of that of the time during the sessions and after. All right. We are going to talk about building DSC resources uh, this morning, and I figured this would be an appropriate topic for today, given we'll be building some this evening. Did you push the button? Uh, Don's, Don's got it covered. So, <laughs> thank you, though. Uh, all right, good deal. Um, so, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Steve Morowski. I am a PowerShell MVP, and currently I'm a technical community manager at Chef. Like Jeffrey alluded to, I used to work at Stack Exchange uh, before I abandoned them to run off to a vendor in the config management space. Um, I blog, Twitter, I'm on GitHub, you can find me all around. Um, I did get to spend a good bit of time with desired state configuration through the Server 2012 R2 uh, early adoption cycle, and then as it rolled into uh, as it rolled into uh, you know full-on general release. And I've been actively using desired state configuration since then, so I've gotten to bump into, you know, some of the good, really good stuff and some of the really painful stuff. And so hopefully today we'll get to learn a little bit from my uh, from my experience in Bruchins and things like that. What we're going to cover, we're going to talk about what exactly a DSC resource is, the structure of a DSC resource, how they're applied. And then we're going to go through and we're going to start building a DSC resource, you know, time pending. Um, it's not going to, be, going to be a very intensive one, but it's going to give us an idea of what, what they look like so that when we're not going in cold to tonight. Um, and of course, as you have questions, please ask. So, what are DSC resources? The DSC resources can be a couple of different things. They can be written in PowerShell. They can be binary commandlets. They can be WMI based. And you'll also see this composite resource come up when we, uh, when we drop in and we take a look <laughs> at, at resources. And a composite resource isn't quite really a resource. Um, we'll actually look at more at these tomorrow when we talk about configurations. They're really a parameterized configuration that can be reused. Um, but they, they also kind of fall under this resources umbrella. What we're really going to focus on today is the PowerShell-based resources, and this is what you're mostly going to see, this is what you're mostly going to write. So DSC resources are the basic unit of work for desired state configuration. This is what represents the elements of what we will manage. We, when we're talking about you know, PowerShell, for the most part, we have nouns and verbs. What we really end up in desired state configuration land is we really tend to align around, very commonly we build our resources around what we think of as the nouns. It's not always a one-to-one -one there, but that, that can, that, that's a good rule of thumb. Or looking at, w, at particular WMI classes. With our PowerShell, with our resources, we want to be very discreet about what we build because that, just like in the, in the PowerShell pipeline where, we're, where commands build on each other, in desired state configuration, our configuration documents build on the resources. So we want our resources to be very, very fine-grained, very low-level. These are the building blocks of what we put together to build our systems. Now, you can build resources that you know, make a lot of assumptions and are locked into a particular workflow, but they're only going to be useful in that one particular scenario. So that's why if we make them very discreet, we can build and compose these things up and that's where those composite resources come in. We can provide, you know, common groupings of these resources, but we want our actual, the resources that we write, to be very, very fine-grained, to be very, very specific. Just to distinguish the uh, composite resources a little bit more, 
The DSC resources, like I said, are lowest level of control. So when I'm talking about managing net, the network stack on my machine, for example, I have network interfaces, I have IP addresses, I have default gateways, I have DNS servers. All of those individual things should have their own resources. I may offer a composite configuration that has the concept of a network adapter, which is very much like what I might see in the network adapter configuration screen, where I'm configuring a DNS server, the IP address, uh, and the network adapter that's associated to. But that shouldn't be one specific resource. That's too much, that's too much coupling there. It doesn't allow me to do a lot of the scenarios that I have to do. And then I have to go break that resource up and write my own resources after, where I can build a composite resource on top of those. Composite, think that you can think of composite resources as functions, just like we build functions on top of existing commandlets. We can build composite resources on top of existing DSC resources. DSC resources are PowerShell modules, either script or binary, or WMI class. Uh, we'll learn from Dan uh, about another way to create uh, WMI class, uh, uh, DSC resources uh, later on. But as of uh, WMF4 and the earlier versions of WMF5, PowerShell modules were primarily the way that we would go about that. And the, a DSC resource these things have to be present on the system in which, uh, in which they're applied. Now, that may seem like kind of an obvious statement, like, well, yeah, the, if the script's not there, you can't run it. But when you start talking about how you, how you might be operating in a, in, a, um, in, a, in a world with desired state configuration, where I'm spinning up a server and I'm pulling a configuration from a central store, you also have to make sure that those resources can get there as well. And if I'm pushing a configuration out to nodes, I have to make sure that I have my custom resources available on those nodes as well. Composite resources, they don't necessarily need to be available on those target nodes, but they do need to be available wherever that configuration is generated. <coughs> and then any custom resources present in those need to be, uh, need to be on the target nodes. So this is one area that I think uh, PowerShell get, which, uh, which Jeffrey referred to earlier, will be uh, very, very helpful in making sure. Yes? In a, uh, in a big DSC like you had at Stack Exchange, how many resources do you end up writing? Um, so at Stack Exchange, what I, uh, my initial scope was to cover a lot of our base server deployment stuff. So I ended up writing about six or seven resources around that. Um, doesn't seem like a lot to do over a year, um, but when you talk about writing tests around it, testing these things out, finding out the upgrade path, figuring out how these things evolve over time, um, uh, it, it actually was a, a decent amount of work uh, to get to that point. Um, but yeah, I had about six or seven custom resources and then I had about 15 composite configurations that would marry the ones that I wrote with some of the existing and, um, and, and go from there. So I, I had many more composite configurations than custom resources. Um, but the composite resources then kind of would represent different functionalities for my systems and, and kind of group group those lower level resources that I needed available. Were they things that the uh, you know the community just hadn't written yet or the PowerShell team? Or do you think that there's some degree that you're always going to be writing on your own too? Uh, it's a little of both. So uh, for example, I wrote a firewall uh, DSC resource and there wasn't one from the community yet. And that's actually one of the things that came out in one of the resource kits. So there's my, re there's my firewall resource out there and there's the, there's the X firewall resource. Uh, so in, in, I don't think there's been like a power plan or a page file one and those were a couple of things that we wanted to control. And so I've got those out, those are out in the community GitHub repository. And uh, I just realized I didn't repeat uh, Lee's question. Uh, he asked if, uh, if there were, uh, if the resources I wrote were ones not provided by the community yet 
or if there are things that I thought that were going to be specific to a particular environment. Um, the, the other side of that is there are definitely things I think that are going to be particular to your environment that aren't necessarily going to be as shareable because they're going to apply to custom applications in your particular uh, in your particular scenario. Uh, one of the one of the resources that I had written um, would install and configure our monitoring service that we were working on at Stack Exchange at the time, and it didn't have an MSI. It didn't uh, you know it, its install it, its installer actually used a custom switch, and then to upgrade it, it was stop the service, copy a new binary, restart the service. And so there wasn't a way with desired state configuration for me to be able to match that workflow. Um, in large part, get my RDP session back. They can be either in C, Windows, System32, uh, Windows PowerShell, V1 modules, or that uh, program files location. <coughs> All right. If, they, if, those loca if your resources are in one of those locations with Windows Management Framework 4, <coughs> get DSC resource will find them. If you're, res if you're on WMF5, one of the previews, your resources can be anywhere on PS module path that is available to the system. So PS module path by default will contain those two locations at the system level. And So these two lower locations, C program files, Windows, PowerShell modules, and uh, Windows System 32, PowerShell V1 modules, those two locations are specified at the system level uh, as far as the environmental variables go, at the machine level for environmental variables. The, you can add locations in WMF5 to that system variable, and they will be discoverable by DSC. So you could have a custom location for your, uh, for your uh, internal modules, for example, if you wanted to. Um, in WMF4, that does not work. So our get DSC resource will return the type of resource, whether they are binary, whether they're PowerShell, whether they're composite. And like I said, composite configs aren't necessarily a configuration of any particular type uh, or they're not really a config they're not really a resource but they are treated as a resource from the perspective of the system oh. all right back to so what does a DSC resource look like so we had this we we had this command out there, get DSC resource, which can go and discover resources on your system. And the reason it can discover them is because there's a convention 
for how we can structure our modules to contain DSC resources. And since they're in this known structure, we can just, we can, uh, there's a, a reliable way to go and find them on our systems. So DSC resources live inside a module. Uh, since we've been using PowerShell 2 for a while, we all know about modules. If you have questions about modules, we got the PM from the module feature here. Uh, Dan's in the back of the room there. So if, if you got any questions on modules, direct them his way. Inside that module, we have to have, in order for them to contain, DSC, contain and use DSC resources, we have to have a PSD1 file. <coughs> we need that module metadata file for one main reason, the version. The version number in a DS, for, for DSC resources is based off of the version of the module that contains those resources. Not, so DSC resources themselves are modules. They can have their own version number. It's irrelevant. The, mo the version that matters is the version in this module that they live in. And the reason that's important is because when the DSC local configuration manager, the DSC agent, needs to process a configuration, it checks for, those, for the module that contains that resource and that version number. And if it doesn't have it, it can go to, the, to a pull server, if you're in a pull server environment, and say, hey, do you have this version? I need this version to apply my resource. If you make changes to a DSC resource and you do not change this version, you may have mismatched or get unexpected results because your system won't know I need a different version of this module. So this version here in that PSD1 file is very very important as you make changes to your DSC resources, as you generate your configuration documents. Uh, just a word of warning, if you're rapidly changing module versions but you haven't regenerated your configurations the, conf the version number from this module actually gets stamped into the, the configuration document that gets generated. Those versions have to match. I can't understate, I can't, you know, understate that enough. I've been bitten by it a handful of times. Those module versions need to match. And that's why, that's why it's important. If you, you haven't revved them up, if you haven't revved it, you're not going to get new versions. If you have mismatched versions, your resource, your DSC configuration will not apply. So it's uh, that's an important bit to have in scope. When do you decide to update a version number? So I try to follow the the semantic versioning uh, idea of uh, major versions at breaking changes, minor versions at more compatible changes, um, and I end up revving my version numbers a lot because. For me, this desired state configuration concept is really about infrastructure as code. And what that means is I can take software development principles and I can apply them to management of my infrastructure. And so I can, you know, take, I can borrow from the Agile community and say, hey, they've got this great concept of iterative development. You make a change, see how it works, move on. You saw this concept back in manufacturing a long time ago. It's standardize your process, make a small change, measure. If it's good, continue with it. If it's bad, throw it out. We can do the same thing in software development. We can do the same thing with managing our infrastructure. And so, especially while I'm developing a new resource, that module version can rev multiple times as I'm trying something out on a system. Um, with the new changes with the debug mode, uh, that might change my process up a little bit. Um, so version 5 introduces a new concept called debug mode where there's no caching in the system and so you can make changes and it's always just going to load fresh. Um, but if you're, in a, if you're in an environment with version 4, uh, which as long as you have 2008 or 2 around, that's going to be a possibility. Um, the version, the versioning is is very very important. Um, back to the infrastructure as code concept. Who here works as a software developer? 
Okay, we got a handful. We got about maybe a, uh, just a quarter of the room. Uh, who here is uh, more in the IT space? Uh, operations, sysadmin, um, IT pro, whatever you self-identify as. All right, pretty much the rest of the room. So everyone who just raised their hands is a sysadmin. If you're doing desired state configuration, if you're writing PowerShell, guess what? You were in that first group too. You guys are developers. You just might not know it as much, and we might not be approaching it as professionally as we need to. Um, and I'll have some resources at the end of this deck uh, for kind of furthering that study. But yeah, uh, we are developers. It's our target, though, isn't necessarily application code. It's the management of our systems, which is just as important as the application code because if our environments go down, that application code isn't doing anything. And so we should approach the scripts and things that we write to run our environments with the same level of professionalism as the application code that's being deployed out on it. So step down from Soapbox and continuing on with DSC resources. Inside my module, I'm going to have a folder called DSC resources. This is that convention that where these things are located so that, the, so that PowerShell knows and the DSC knows where to go and look for in my modules for, these, uh, for my resources. In my DSC resource folder, I can have one or more DSC resources. And those resources are modules themselves. I recommend that you put a uh, module metadata file there and that you export, get uh, the three functions that we're going to look at in a minute. You don't have to have them there. Um, I found it smooths out a couple of scenarios. Then we have a PSM1 file, or actually it could be any kind of file. It could be, any, it could be a PSM1 file. It's whatever's loaded by that PSD1 file. If you don't have the PSD1, you definitely need a PSM1. Uh, but that's where our resource functions are going to live. And then we get this schema.moff document. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. But that document is what allows DSC to take parameters. So DSC, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't um, dug into it yet, the local configuration manager, the agent on the Windows system that applies the configurations, the documents that it reads are based on MOF, the Manage Object Framework, uh, which is a way to serialize to disk or to write to disk or to express in a text file SIM classes. SIM is a common information model. Microsoft's implementation of SIM is WMI. So the local configuration manager is based on WMI. It's a way to take WMI, WMI types and map them to your parameters for your functions that the local configuration manager is going to call. Because WMI types and .NET types, <coughs> while similar in some areas, are not the same things. So we need to have a mapping for that. We need to have a mapping for those so that those types can go back and forth properly. All right, we talked about this. So I recommend having that module manifest inside your DSC resource to export the test, get, and set target resource commands. These are the three commands that we need to implement to have a DSC resource. Um, the reason I recommend having your module manifest inside your resource export these commands is uh, in, the, in the configuration generation process, Sometimes import DSC resource has issues with caching. And again, debug mode can help with this. But having that module manifest explicitly export those commands has seemed to help in my experience, making sure that it can find the commands for that resource. So all three of our get, test, and set target resource commands they're going to share the same parameter set. That's also very important. We, we don't 
have different parameter sets for those commands. They all have the same, they all, they all accept the same parameters. And then I just described the schema.moth. The other important thing in the schema.moth document is this concept of a friendly name. And the friendly name allows you to have your resources kind of namespace qualified. So if you look at what Microsoft shipped in Box, and if you look at some of the samples that they've shipped, if you look at the examples on, on the GitHub, uh, the community GitHub repository, you'll see things like stack exchange underscore page file or MSFT underscore archive. And these, this, these allow you know, our resources to kind of be disambiguated, but we don't want to type that all when we're writing our configuration documents. So we have this concept of a friendly name, and that allows you, instead of writing MSFT underscore archive, to just write archive. And that's defined in that schema.moth document. So in our resource module, we have three main functions, get target resource, which returns, as it stands, the current state of the resource to be configured, or the element to be configured. Um, it does not necessarily allow you to kind of model a system. Um, it only will return the state of resources you've modeled in a configuration document currently. Um, I don't know if there's plans otherwise, but uh, currently that's uh, what get target resource will do. What it does do is it will return you a nice structured graph of what your configuration looks like. So you can say, uh, if you do get DSC configuration, it will use this function to get back all of the, uh, uh, an object representation of the current state of all of your DSC, uh, all of the resources you've configured. Set target resource. This is the workhorse in the, uh, in the DSC uh, configuration, or in the, I'm sorry, in the DSC resource. What this will do is everything that it needs to do to take you from your unknown state and get you to the known good state. And so that implies that, hey, this thing might have to handle all sorts of scenarios and we could end up having a lot of logic, a lot of work in this thing. Um, set target resource is very important for bringing you from where you were to where you want to be. So it, you know, in the case of a Windows feature, nice and straightforward, either it's installed or it's not. Not necessarily. What happens if it's removed from the box and the bits aren't there to turn on? You have to be able to know to go point at a install source somewhere to go get those box, go get those bits. So you need to have you need to have some smarts inside set target resource. Uh, Depending on what you're configuring, those, sp those smarts are going to be more or less, uh, more or less comprehensive than others. And then we have test target resource. Test target resource is a very important function because this is what determines whether or not set target resource will actually run. This, I can't underscore enough how important, yes, in the back. So the question is, DSC is about ensuring the configuration, um, in, in ensuring a system's configuration. So you have your set and your test, which, which are pretty much the workhorses, and why, what's the purpose of get? Um, so in addition to setting and testing, I also want to be able to report the state of my system. And that's where get, uh, that's where get target resource comes in, um, because it, a lot, it provides the plumbing for future reporting, it, it uh, for allows me to interactively query the state of a system. Maybe, maybe I'm at a point, uh, especially in the evolution of a resource, maybe I'm at a point where I've got a, a system or I'm trying to go from my unknown state to a known good state, and it's stopping somewhere. Get target resource or get DSC resource can leverage get target resource to give me the current state of that system, and I can see what's not changing. Yes, Don. Give it a config and point it out a machine and it will 
tell you where that machine's config differs, and that relies on the GAT. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so uh, Don mentioned that version 5 introduces this, uh, the, the uh, concept of uh, compare DSC configuration, which allows you to take a, an existing configuration document and compare that to a, a live system to see where the differences are. And get target resource is the, uh, the back end support to provide that. And that's actually very important. Yes, uh, let's uh, start in the front here. Uh, previously, previously, you also said you had to create your own resource to, um, yeah, for the program you had. Mm -hmm. You had to stop the service. Uh, but isn't that possible with these functions yet? Yes, so these are, these, are in the res these are in a resource. So um, the reason I, so the question was, was with these functions, can't I, uh, can't I do my custom, uh, can't I make my custom resource to uh, stop, my, stop my service, copy the file, everything? Yes, I would do them in, the, in this. I, I implemented that, that logic inside this command. So my test target resource would actually go and check is the file ver are the file versions different? You know, if they are, or is the config file different? And if and if so, stop the service. So I, and then I can go into set and actually do the things that it needed to do. Um, the reason I had to do that was because I could I didn't have hooks into um, running and you know having a conditional application of resources through the local configuration manager. All right, uh, we have another question. Yeah, just off the back of Don's compare notes, mm -hmm. um, something we hear a lot at the moment, we do with pools of servers, and a patch might roll onto one server, and it turns out to be a service is disabled on that one server, or a language setting is different. Now, obviously, if I had a DSC to set up that server, then I could do the compare. Is there any way to go backwards? Is there any way to go from a server config and generate a DSC? Mm -hmm. So so there, there isn't inbox that I'm aware of. Um, however, there is a third-party tool, um, great, uh, great company, um, full disclosure, they're friends of mine, um, but a uh, very cool product for infrastructure visualization and testing. Um, the company is called ScriptRock and the tool is Guardrail. And what it, it can do is it can profile your system and within parameters you specify, like say, hey, watch this particular part of the registry or Hey, I have IIS configured. Watch IIS, and it will watch all of the things in relation to IIS. Or watch my pat, watch the patches that are applied, and it can it can generate it can back generate configs for um, for DSC, for Puppet, for Chef, um, for and, and for other systems as well, and um, as well as g giving you reporting and alerting on that kind of thing. Um, so while it's not a Inbox capability of DSC, unless I'm missing something in WMF five uh, off the top of my head, um, guardrail would be uh, it, would be a, a whole solution. Different architecture. You know, when we talk to uh, we, we, we closely working with some teams doing uh, internal Microsoft Teams. We described how you use desired state configuration. They had a great reply. They said, "Great, we love it. That's the last thing we want to do. The first thing we want to do is we have an existing system." We'd like to harvest that system to generate a configuration document. Then from that configuration document, we want to test it against our other instances. Don't change anything. Just tell us about errors. We'll then take that and say, oh, I'll correct it by hand, or, oh, the configuration document's wrong. I'll tweak that. Do that to the point where they're confident, and then flip the switch and say, yeah. now the last thing I want to do is to set it and force it to do anything from scratch that way. Yeah. But currently, right now, on the get target, resource, you have to specify a specific instance, and it returns you the data about that instance. We're looking at extending that architecture so it can support effectively wild cards. As you can imagine saying, well, get, you know, get target for all the file systems, uh, all the files in the file system, that wouldn't work. So it is a hole in the architecture that we're looking to, to resolve, hopefully in version 5. We'll see. That would, if that would be, like, say, a really useful intro, so I work with lots of different enterprises. I'm never going to probably get them to put DSC in as a config option, but if I took it on myself to use it as a compare, I could use it, and that takes them down the path. Exactly. By the way, as you implement these functions, if you decide to write one of these, what I found myself is that what's very useful is to have a compare object function 
And a compare object function, you know, we've got compare object as a command line, but it really compares two sets. You'd like to take two instances and have it return which properties are different. And then if you call that, and then you just, for test target, you call that, and then if the answer is there's zero differences, then it's true. And for test resource, you call that, and it'll tell you exactly what things you need to resolve. So I'm, I might publish that, my compare object, because it's... Okay, uh, just to kind of summarize that little conversation, um, wouldn't it be awesome if DSC could take a look and profile an existing system and make it happen? Jeffrey Snover replied, yes, that's awesome, and we'd love to do that. Maybe WMF5, maybe after that. There's product teams at Microsoft that would love that. Cool, awesome, and hey, compare object. It'd be awesome if it compared the properties. Uh, p compare object with PS object dot properties of each of them works, uh, can, can work as well in that instance. Um, and then Jeffrey's got an awesome function he's gonna share for, for doing that as well. Because then we could use compare DSC resource, or compare DSC configuration to validate against two different systems. All right, summary over. Um, back to test target resource. Oh, yes. One small question on this uh, subject. You mentioned reporting very briefly, mm -hmm. but uh, is there any way to um, uh, report the current state of my environment by the PS resources, what went wrong, what doesn't work? Because if we have external audits of external companies, I have to be able to guarantee the state of my infrastructure with certain configurations. Any way to plug into reporting or to prove them that this is the state of the current infrastructure? Yes. So uh, in version f in WMF four, there is a compliance server which basically gives you a it, it complies a policy. It doesn't. Um, WMF five uh, they've extended that and there's a reporting server. I'm not full up on the details for the reporting server yet. So maybe somebody else will jump in and, and uh, expound upon that. Um, but the infrastructure for that, I know, uh, in test DSC configuration, they've expanded that to um, actually go through and kind of give you a, these are all in, in an, it gives you all the resources that are okay and it gives you all the ones that have problems. Um, all of the logging for DSC runs, it's logged to the event log. So anything that failed or so you can have, um, anything that failed you can have, um, if you're doing centralized event logging um, or event log forwarding, something like that, uh, you can definitely leverage that infrastructure. Um, or, <coughs> shameless plug, um, if you're using Chef, uh, we aggregate all that centrally as well. Um, but there is a... Yeah, in, in, the, in the September preview, there's a command like get DSC configuration status. Minus all gives you all of them. And what it does is it tells you if all the configuration runs, by default we run every 30 minutes, tells you whether things were in state or out of state, and what things were in state, and what resources were out of state. So you know with pretty fine granularity when things are in compliance and when they're out of compliance. In the future, right now it just tells you that the resource is out of state. In the future it will tell you which properties of the resource were out of state. So. So yeah, so that, that plumbing is being built. Um, and just to, to get that so it gets on the recording, um, there is a uh, get DSC resource state. Is that? Uh, when get DSC configuration status. Da get DSC configuration status. And it, with dash all, it will go through all the DSC runs, tell you what resources were, were good, which ones are bad, and awesome. It, it, and take a look at that. Yes. How do you manage the situation where the configuration is so shifted that you say to DSC, right, bugger this, I can't do any more to fix this, exit? Um, so if uh, if the first configure, so if, if we hit an, uh, an error, um, uh, what, and this is one of the things in, in resources you gotta be careful of. How you execute, how you execute DSC configurations, this matters. If you're in a pull server environment, non-terminating errors and terminating errors will both exit a um, will both exit a configuration run, as will a prompt for confirmation. So if you've missed a uh, you know a dash confirm colon, uh, colon true somewhere or dash force or something, um, those things will exit a DSC configuration. So once you hit that first error, you stop. If you're running start dash DSC configuration, non-terminating errors will be reported back in the verbose stream, 
or in the in the um, it, actually in the in the airstream coming back from the job, but they will continue on. Terminating errors will stop. Um, so if you're when you're writing your resource and you're writing your set target resource and you hit something that's going to totally stop things, make sure you throw a terminating error. Um, and then at that point, that's where you know DSC comes in very handy because I have a modeled state of my system. New OS, lay down config, back up and running. Um, that was that was one of the you know the beautiful things is I could keep evolving my infrastructure when I was at Stack Exchange and slowly adding additional capabilities. But if I had a problem in one server and in my web farm, but the other ten were operating just fine. New OS, new config, back up and running in 20 minutes, you know, and that's from bare metal. So, um, you know, from from that standpoint, you start caring less and less about individual servers, and that's one of the you know the benefits of a system that does infrastructure as code is we can treat our infrastructure more like cattle than like uh, than like lo snowflakes or uh, loving lovingly crafted pieces of art um, because we can we can stamp them out as we need them. So uh, last bit before I have to wrap up here, the really important thing about test target resource, if this does not report accurately what you want to do, you will either not be calling set target resource when you need to, or you will be calling it too often. And in the grand scheme of things, kind of the ideal world, you're running this and applying autocorrect, so you have a self-healing infrastructure. If test target resources is reporting improperly, that throws that whole thing out of whack because now I'm running code on my system at, in, at an interval of every half hour or so, and if it's getting wrong results, I might be screwing up my system state further and further and further. So that is something we really want to be very cognizant of. Uh, last thing before I get out of here, and um, if you have further questions and want to follow up on this, uh, I'll be around today and tomorrow. Unfortunately, I have to leave on Wednesday, so I won't be here Wednesday, but, so, but grab me in the next day or so. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, further reading. As I just told you all, you're all developers. We get to get up to speed on a lot of different developer -y things. And a couple of books that I found helpful around testing. We've got Working Effectively with Legacy Code and The Art of Unit Testing. Really good reads. Uh, in the configuration management space, Promise Theory and In Search of Certainty by Mark Burgess. If you want your head to hurt, those are really good books to read. Um, there's some really cool stuff in there, but ouch. Um, and then uh, my former coworker, Tom uh, Limoncelli, uh, recently published The Practice of Cloud Administration. They cover some, uh, some DevOps concepts and uh, kind of this new IT style there. Uh, Continuous Delivery was referenced earlier. Uh, Jez Humble and David Farley. Very good book there. And one of my favorites, uh, Clean Code by uh, Robert Uncle Bob Martin. Uh, really good, kind of really good introduction of, of doing the right thing around software development. So, dude. Yes. The Phoenix Project. Well, that's a, yeah, that. <laughs> I think I beat that one to death uh, a little bit, but um, yes, if you're if you're totally new to the DevOps concepts and you want to see uh, kind of what this stuff's all about, what the concepts are, the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim and uh, Kevin Bear and George Spafford, very excellent read. Uh, last MVP summit, I gave away a box of about a hundred of them, um, and I've uh, uh, yeah, I've got a couple copies personally. Um, very good read. It's it's fiction. It's not great fiction, but the storyline is is very much true. You'll recognize if you've worked in IT for any length of time, you'll recognize the scenarios. Um, and the thing I love about it is it's set in uh, in the IT organization for an auto parts manufacturer. So it's in an enterprise environment. It's not one of the you know one of the unicorn organizations like Netflix and Facebook and Stack Exchange. It's it's showing DevOps concepts. In a in an enterprise space, and really kind of sets the story for why DevOps is important and matters. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you.
Thanks. Dan, Dan's, uh, that's virtual now. Dan's handling that. No, you, you push it. I want to see if it works. Button pushed. <laughs>